Here and now, in the year of our Lord 2022, there is no disputing that Paul Heyman is still one of the very best talents WWE has to offer. He's one of the best managers, or advocates, agents, whatever you want to call it, in the history of the wrestling business, and like anyone in his position, he's helped plenty of people along the way. Heyman's career has spanned some 35 odd years and has seen him go from regional territories to WCW to ECW and finally to WWE. WWE. Along the way, he has revolutionized the business and helped to launch and maintain the careers of some of the industry's greats. There have been many Paul Heyman guys across his three decades plus in sports entertainment, which, for the purposes of this video, will be people he actively managed on screen and not just those he has mentored or vouched for backstage and in the media. But just how do they stack up against one another? Who did Heyman help become world champions and Hall of Famers? And who was but a blip on the creative genius's radar? I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is every Paul Heyman guy ranked from worst to best. Join us. Number 25, Curtis Axel. Curtis Axel had a lot of things going for him, but it just never seemed to all come together for him while he was in WWE. He floundered after emerging during the initial incarnation of NXT The Game Show as Michael McGillicutty, stripping him of a ready-made name and identity and making him blander than bland amongst a sea of abject blandness. In the spring of 2013, WWE tried to push him by renaming him Curtis Axel, the new moniker a combination of his father Kurt Mr. Perfect Hennig and his grandfather Larry the Axe Hennig, pairing him up with Paul Heyman and giving him the Intercontinental title. He got some key wins over the likes of Chris Jericho and Triple H while under Heyman's wing, but their association didn't really click and Axel was ultimately overshadowed by partner and fellow Heyman guy Ryback. The Heyman-Axel association ended after six forgettable months, with Axel seemingly no better off for it afterwards than he was before. Number 24, Cesaro. WrestleMania 30 and the episode of Raw that followed it seemed like they were huge turning points in the career of Cesaro. At the showcase of the Immortals, the hard-working Swiss Superman won the inaugural Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal and then, the next night on Raw, was endorsed by Hulk Bloody Hogan. Also on that Raw, Cesaro dumped manager Zeb Coulter, revealing himself to be a Paul Heyman guy. The hope was that Heyman could do the talking for his new charge, getting him over on the microphone as Cesaro got himself over by being excellent in the ring. A good idea in theory, it didn't turn out so well in practice, as WWE immediately called off a push that, logically, would have led the former Claudio Castanoli to the Intercontinental title. Instead, he started losing all of his matches and didn't get a sniff of any title. A mouth-watering Cesaro vs Brock Lesnar bout didn't end up happening either, as the cesaro Heyman relationship was basically just forgotten about. Number 23, Jimmy Snooker. Before ECW fully forged an identity of its own, with a crop of hungry up-and-comers leading the charge, the company relied, to an extent, on stars from the past to drawing crowds. Chief among them was Jimmy Superfly Snooker, who was a member of a sort of resurrected Dangerous Alliance in Eastern Championship Wrestling. Snooker joined up with the likes of Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert and Don Morocco as Hot Stuff International, winning the ECW television title once and ECW heavyweight title twice, including being the inaugural champion during his time in Philadelphia. Heyman came on board after Snooker had dropped the strap to Morocco, however, and their on-screen relationship was fleeting. Still, for what it was, the pairing of the goofy 80s yuppie and the barefoot savage was just fine, and Heyman was a good pick to do the talking for the oft-rambling Superfly. Number 22, the Samoan SWAT team. Those surprised by Paul Heyman's association with Roman Reigns and the Usos should remember that the legendary manager has had history with the family. Back in the late 1980s, Heyman was given the Samoan SWAT team to steer after they took over from the original Midnight Express and Heyman's feud with Jim Cornette and the new version of the Midnights. They were only together for a few months and weren't able to win the tag team titles or anything, but they had some solid matches in the mid-card with teams like the Steiners and the Road Warriors. The partnership with Heyman just sort of fizzled out, and Heyman was replaced by Oliver Humperdinck. Heyman himself would go on to manage Mean Mark Callis. Many years later, Samoan SWAT team member Fatu, aka Rikishi, personally thanked Paul Heyman for his efforts during this time in his own distinctive way. Emphasis on stink. <laughs> Number 21, Rob Van Dam. Paul Heyman knew what a special talent Rob Van Dam was when he was booking him in ECW. 
I mean, hell, why else do you think he had the whole effing show hold the ECW Television Championship for almost two years, with a view to making him the combined TV and world champion, which sadly didn't happen due to unforeseen circumstances? As ECW was set to relaunch in the summer of 2006, Heyman began vouching for RVD on screen too, and helped Van Dam beat John Cena for the WWE title at the second one night stand. It could have been the start of a long and entertaining union, but Van Dam was famously busted with some of that wacky backy, and then suspended while reigning as both WWE and ECW champion just a few weeks after his one night stand triumph. The upshot was he lost the WWE title first to Edge and then the ECW title to Big Show, with Heyman turning heel to help hand the belt to the world's largest athlete. Interestingly, Van Dam was pitched turning heel and becoming a Paul Heyman guy once more during his last WWE run in 2014, but declined the opportunity. Number 20, Ryback. The pairing of Ryback and Paul Heyman could have been good for freshening up both characters at the time that it came about. The big guy was stagnating as a bullying heel after a hot streak, and Heyman had pretty much nothing to do after splitting from CM Punk, with Brock Lesnar taking one of his autumn winter vacations. Ryback teamed up with Heyman and Curtis Axel to take on the straight edge superstar, which led to a number of singles and handicap matches. Heyman and Ryback displayed some decent chemistry in segments together, and the sight of the jacked up muscle man pushing around the wheelchair-bound manager and getting kisses on the cheek for his dutiful work was really funny stuff. Regrettably though, neither man wanted to work with the other one. Heyman said years later that he knew Ryback wouldn't be a huge star in the business because he was a schmuck, while Ryback said he didn't like Heyman personally and also didn't believe that he needed a manager at the time. Number 19, Heidenreich. WWE had tried using Heyman to elevate a bunch of big old beef boys on SmackDown in late 2003 when he took charge of Matt Morgan and Nathan Jones, while also simultaneously helping guide Big Show and Brock Lesnar. Morgan and Jones flamed out quickly, but that didn't put WWE off retrying the formula and paired Heyman up with another monster not too long after. Paul partnered with the poetry reading psychopath Heidenreich in an attempt to rid the wrestling world of The Undertaker. They, of course, failed in their pursuit, just as WWE failed in their pursuit to get Heidenreich over as a top-level heel, and their alliance imploded in spectacular fashion. While teaming up against the dead man on an episode of SmackDown, Heidenreich was overcome by his fear of caskets and fed his manager to the Reaper. He actually ran away as Heyman was dumped on his head with a tombstone and then placed into a casket himself. Number 18, The Dudley Boys. Before utilizing the services of Heidenreich, Heyman had tried to ruin The Undertaker's life by playing mind games while being backed up by those damn Dudleys. Obviously, Heyman, Bubba, and Devon went back to their ECW days and were united in trying to chase the recently returned Phenom away from the blue brand. After challenging them to find a way to dominate SmackDown, the Dudleys responded to Heyman by kidnapping Paul Bearer. Taker was given an ultimatum by Heyman, who demanded that the dead man join forces with the extremists or Bearer would suffer further physical consequences. This all ultimately led to a concrete crypt match between The Undertaker and the Dudleys in the main event of the disastrous Great American Bash 2004 pay-per-view. Taker won, but decided to bury Bearer in concrete anyway. For the lols, I guess. The table breakers were only aligned with Heyman officially for a short period before Heyman disappeared for a bit to then reappear with Heidenreich. It was fun while it lasted and helped freshen up Bubba and Devon after an age as a mid-card babyface act. Number 17, Mean Mark Callus. Many years before Heyman was antagonizing The Undertaker, he was leading Mark Calloway to the ring during his WCW days as Mean Mark Callus. Mean Mark was strictly a mid-card act and was basically something for Paulie dangerously to do for a while as he didn't have any anything better on. Heyman worked well as a mouthpiece for the imposing but green callus, but their stint together was brief and didn't exactly lead to much success. Not that Heyman didn't see a lot in Calloway. Far from it, in fact, he later remarked that the tall Texan had a remarkable maturity for somebody so new to the business and figured he would be a star once he left WCW. Callus scored a bunch of victories over jobbers on television and got a commendable win over flying Brian Pillman at the Clash of the Champions special, but fell where it counted to Lex Luger at the Great American Bash and soon left for WWE. Number 16, 911. The 
massive 911 was a perfect encapsulation of how Paul Heyman had the ability, especially when calling the shots in ECW, of hiding a talent's weaknesses while accentuating their positives. Positives: 911 was big and imposing and looked cool. Negatives: He wasn't a great wrestler and would likely be exposed during matches. Solution: Have him show up at opportune moments and dish out a choke slam or two, often at the behest of Heyman. The enforcer of the extreme attitude that the ECW head honcho wanted to push, 911 was a member of Heyman's dangerous alliance alongside Sabu and the Tasmaniac. Heyman didn't lead 911 to title glory or anything like that, and there was always a ceiling for the distinctly one note character, but he got him over strong by sticking to what worked. Unfortunately, Heyman would have to fire him IRL after the man behind the 911 persona, Alfred Poling, was found to be mistreating members of the ring crew. Number 15, The Midnight Express. The original Midnight Express, led by Paul Heyman, taking on the newer Midnight Express, led by Jim Cornette, was something of a dream match that, in truth, turned into a bit of a nightmare. The original Midnight Express, Dennis Condry and Randy Rose, who had used the moniker in the AWA, were brought in to make up for the loss of Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard, who had been feuding with the Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton version of the Midnights, but had jumped ship to WWE. Cornette pitched the Midnights versus Midnights feud, and Dusty Rhodes gave it the green light, leading to some cracking interviews and angles as they built up their matches, with Cornette and Dangerously as good as ever on the stick. In a case of very bad timing, Dusty lost the book and Jim Crockett Jr. decided to sell to Turner, putting the feud in limbo and things just got messier and messier from there until the whole thing fell apart. Still, for the brief time that they were together, the old Midnight Express and Paul Heyman were good value. Just a shame we never got to see the big loser leaves town blow off. Number 14, Larry Zabisco. After he was kayfabe fired as an announcer, Heyman banded together a group of renegades and outlaws and formed the Dangerous Alliance, based on a stable he had previously managed in the AWA. A crucial part of this new gang was Larry Zabisco, the living legend who was on the downswing of his career at the time, but added credibility as an experienced veteran. He also gained a new nickname, The Cruncher, after slamming a car door on Barry Windham's hand. Larry wasn't the focal point of the group, but his inclusion in it got him and Heyman a lot of TV time and led to major matches like the sensational War Games main event against Sting's squadron at WrestleWar 92. Zabisco was the first man kicked out of the Alliance for his role in the Wrestle War defeat. After his expulsion, Larry was mainly used to put over new talent like Steve Austin, Cactus Jack, and Scotty Flamingo. Number 13, Arn Anderson. Two very different personalities that complemented each other well, Heyman would have been a great manager for a solo Arn Anderson, but instead made do with him as a member of the Dangerous Alliance, where he usually teamed up with fellow tag team master Bobby Eaton. The Enforcer was no stranger to being a member of a powerful unit, of course, having previously been a member of the Four Horsemen, an outfit that occasionally had a manager, though they could all cut a fine promo, but usually found frontman Ric Flair doing the talking for them. Double A's role in the Alliance was similar to his job in the Horsemen. He was a dominant tag team bruiser and helped beat people up in pursuit of championship glory. Heyman did much of his talking for him and helped run interference or stir the pot from ringside. Under Heyman's watchful eye, Anderson and Eaton won the WCW tag titles. Arn would later work one match for Heyman's ECW, headlining the 1994 When Worlds Collide event, teaming with Terry Funk against Sabu and former Dangerous Alliance teammate Bobby Eaton. Which brings us to number 12, Bobby Eaton. A pros pro who was respected throughout the industry as one of wrestling's very best in-ring performers, Bobby Eaton did most of his talking in the squared circle and whether as a solo competitor, tag teamer or member of a group, usually relied on a manager to do his actual talking for him. Eaton knew all about Heyman, of course, thanks to the feud between the two Midnight Express incarnations years earlier. He put the past behind him to be a member of the Dangerous Alliance and was rewarded with a tag team title run alongside Arn Anderson. In a stable full of top tier workers, beautiful Bobby stood out as somebody who could carry the load and hold things together in big match scenarios. He also played a big part in the formation of the Alliance itself, helping to conspire with Heyman, Rick Rude and Medusa to dupe Sting, naturally, and get the US title onto the ripped waist of Ravishing Rick. Number 11, Tommy Rich and Austin Idol. 
Two of the first Paul Heyman guys were Tommy Rich and Austin Idol, who Heyman managed in 1987 while paying his dues in Memphis. Heyman had got the gig thanks to the kind words of Bam Bam Bigelow, who convinced Idol to give the former ringside photographer a shot on the show proper. Playing a spoiled rich yuppie from New York, Paul Dangerly, as he was called on commentary, was a total heat seeker, and while representing the universal heartthrob and wildfire Tommy Rich, got into a dispute with the king of Memphis, Jerry Lawler. Their feud was wild and heated and announced the young Heyman as an immediate force in the industry. It all culminated in a tag team scaffold match, with Idol and Rich taking on Lawler and superstar Bill Dundee. The way the bout was promoted in the build-up suggested that Heyman would get his comeuppance and would take a fall from the structure. Reports differ, but according to Lawler, right before the match, Heyman informed Jerry that he wouldn't be climbing the scaffold as he was afraid of heights, causing a furious Lawler to legitimately punch him in the face, breaking his jaw. It was the last act of Heyman in Continental, as he soon left for the AWA. Still, while he was there, he was a magnet for controversy and really added to what was one of the best feuds of the time. Number 10, Team Angle. Heyman had tried to get Kurt Angle to come to ECW fresh off of his Olympic gold medal success, but Kurt, who had been led to believe that ECW was a more pure wrestling promotion, was put off by a gaudy crucifixion angle he witnessed while visiting the ECW arena and vowed to never work for the Philadelphia-based outfits. The two would find themselves working closely with one another in 2002, with Heyman a key member of the SmackDown writing team and Angle reigning as WWE champion on the blue brand. They were paired up on screen as Kurt headed for a WrestleMania showdown with Brock Lesnar, who Heyman had betrayed a short time prior. The Olympic hero was personality personified and didn't need a manager, but the pairing worked and added a new dimension to the headline feud. The addition of Team Angle, Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin, also added another twist and meant that the amateur standouts were a force for the sadly short time that they were together. Number 9. Sabu Though the two had a love-hate relationship over the years, there is no doubting that Sabu and Paul Heyman did a lot for one another, both in the ring and behind the scenes. The suicidal, homicidal, genocidal, death-defying Sabu helped put ECW on the map, but conversely, Sabu may not have become the star he did without the platform offered by Heyman, as well as his booking and career guidance. Heyman was also essential to helping get Sabu over, since the man from Bombay, Michigan didn't speak as part of his gimmick. Heyman not only talked up how madly dangerous Sabu was, but also brought him out for matches in Hannibal Lecter-style restraints. While Heyman added a lot to the presentation of Sabu and relied upon the performer to help his product, he also wasn't afraid to sever ties and publicly fired him in the ring after Sabu prioritized a Japanese tour over his ECW bookings. Number 8. Taz Championed by Heyman both on screen and off, Taz benefited enormously from the ECW leader's direction and nous when it came to present talent. First, Heyman took charge of the Tasmaniac, a wild and anachronistic gimmick that looked like something right out of the early 80s territorial system. Under Heyman's tutelage, the Tasmaniac returned from a neck injury with a new updated look and demeanor and soon established himself as ECW's resident shoot-style ass kicker. A textbook case of accentuating the positives and hiding the negatives, Taz became a star because he was talked up big by Heyman on the mic and protected in matches, angles, and storylines. The man who had been considered too small for major promotions like WCW and WWE was presented as a feared hard nut who would suplex you out of your boots before choking you out in record time. With Heyman's guidance both on and off screen, Taz became a hot commodity and eventually caught the interest of Vince McMahon's organization. Though their relationship was at times fractured, the human suplex machine maintains that Heyman always treated him well, never owed him a dime or bounced a check, and that without him, he wouldn't have been able to enjoy the career he had. Number 7. Eddie Gilbert Years before taking the helm in ECW, Paul Heyman cut his creative teeth under the guidance of Eddie Gilbert in the Continental Wrestling Federation. The two had crossed paths while Hot Stuff was working as an enhancement talent in WWE and Heyman was a ringside photographer, their friendship continuing as Eddie mentored Paul and passed on the knowledge that he had gained from growing up in the business. They apparently argued like old ladies, but it was a productive partnership and Heyman admits that he learned a lot about the business from the third generation star. As well as their relationship behind the scenes, Heyman, as Paul Lee dangerously, became part of Gilbert's Hot Stuff Inc. stable. 
Once again, it just worked, and they played off each other extremely well. It was also Gilbert who, years later, would bring Heyman into Eastern Championship Wrestling, which he was booking at the time, which Heyman would take over and turn into Extreme Championship Wrestling before long. Number 6. Rick Rude Rick Rude was the key to making the Dangerous Alliance work in WCW, as he was a top heel with a name and reputation that immediately made the group a genuine threat. He was also crucial to Paulie Dangerously's kayfabe crusade to seek vengeance on the company that fired him as a commentator. He retained his manager's license. Somewhat reminiscent of Ravishing Rick's previous pairing with Bobby the Brain Heenan, he and Heyman meshed tremendously well. While Heyman was more than happy to sing his client's praises and assist him in any way possible, including setting up the scheme that gave Rude the US title from an injured sting, Paulie also contends that it was while working with Rude that he learned more about the artistry of being a heel than at any other point in his career. The sexiest man alive had the experience and was at the top of his game as Heyman briefly oversaw his career, and Heyman would take the lessons he learned and teach them to others later on. Number 5. Stunning Steve Austin while Rick Rude was the linchpin of the Dangerous Alliance, the breakout star of the pack was Steve Austin, a comparative rookie compared to the rest of the crew. According to Heyman, he immediately saw Austin's potential and tried to help him in any way he could, both as his on-screen manager and backstage confidant and cheerleader. Everyone could see that Stunning Steve had plenty of ability and that, given the right opportunities, he would go far in the business. But few had the Nostradamic gifts of Heyman, who, in a 1991 WCW magazine article predicted that Austin would be the biggest star in the business, stating that he was still five or six years away from his prime and would dominate the industry by the year 2000. Hey Paul, you don't by any chance have this week's lottery numbers, do you? WCW brass were initially against Austin being in the group, but Heyman fought for it and the Texas Rattlesnake benefited tremendously. When Austin was fired by WCW in 1995, the first person to call him was, you guessed it, Paul Heyman. The creative freedom he was given during his short stint in ECW helped him find the foundation of what would become the Stone Cold character. Number 4. The Big Show Heyman shockingly turned on Brock Lesnar at the 2002 Survivor Series, costing the next big thing the WWE title and handing it to his new client, The Big Show. Well, if you're going to have an angry Brock Lesnar gunning for you, it makes sense to hide behind somebody who's as big as a wall, I suppose. Show's title reign wasn't one to write home about, as he lost to Kurt Angle within a month, though Angle would join up with Heyman and, by association, Show soon after. Heyman continued to manage Show, however, and they were seen conspiring together over the course of the next year plus. Fast forward a few years and history repeated itself as Heyman did the dirty on Rob Van Dam, turning on the whole effing show in order to give the big show the ECW title. This reign was far more successful, lasting a solid six months. Show was effective as Heyman's muscle, and Heyman ensured that the title remained on Show's massive shoulders by continuously stacking the odds against the babyface challengers. Heyman was a supporter of Show backstage too, and their backstage chemistry translated on screen. It is no coincidence that when Heyman was fired slash quit following the dismal December to dismember, that Paul White quickly followed him out the door. Number 3. Roman Reigns Paul Heyman is a world-class manager, Roman Reigns is a world-class wrestler. Despite both being excellent at what they do, it was hard to picture them together. The slimy son of the New York lawyer and the super cool Samoan stud. It shouldn't work in theory, but it absolutely does in practice, as Heyman has been stood at ringside to assist the tribal chief in his ascent from being a top star to THE top star. It has been while Reigns has been aligned with Heyman as his special counsel that he has enjoyed a historic universal title run and managed to see off every competitor that has stood in his way, including every former universal champion to this point. Heyman's positioning has also been central to the drama between the big dog and the beast incarnate, as he seemingly holds the key when it comes to where the universal title ends up. Seeing someone with Heyman's stock bow and kneel at the feet of Roman has helped tremendously when it comes to the tribal chief's perception and has surely converted plenty of naysayers. There have been some hiccups along the way, sure, but everyone is thriving in this scenario and doing some of their best ever work. Number 2. CM Punk 
When CM Punk signed his WWE developmental deal and was sent to OVW in 2005, he didn't have a lot of supporters in either the office or the locker room. Except one. Then Booker Paul Heyman saw the Straight Edge Superstar as somebody who could be a major player moving forward and booked the territory around him before lobbying for Punk's inclusion in the relaunched ECW. Six years later, and after Punk had made Paul Heyman guy common parlance during his pipe bomb promo, Heyman returned as an on-air talent, and with Brock Lesnar taking one of his customary vacations, he hitched his wagon to the WWE Champion. And they were an instant hit, and pretty much ran raw for a time there. Once again, Punk was somebody who didn't necessarily need a manager, but Heyman helped establish Punk as a pure heel, and the two were thick as thieves when it came to antagonizing everyone from John Cena and Ryback to The Undertaker and The Rock. Heyman balanced his responsibilities to both Punk and Lesnar in the beginning, but inevitably, something had to give, and Paul ended up going back to his beast full time. Number one. Brock Lesnar. The story goes that it was Taz who saw some WWE veterans and agents giving a pre-TV debut Brock Lesnar some bad advice while Brock was working dark matches and not wanting to screw up such a massive prospect, turned Brock onto Paul Heyman. Brock exploded onto the main roster in 2002, and with Heyman pulling the strings from ringside, went undefeated for months, winning the King of the Ring and then the WWE title in record time. Heyman may have temporarily traded Lesnar in for Big Show and Kurt Angle, but they were soon back on terms, and Heyman was once again helping Lesnar capture and hold on to the WWE title. When Brock returned in 2012, he brought back with him his advocate, who had been on the outs for over five years himself. Since then, the two have established themselves as possibly the greatest manager-slash-wrestler combination in WWE history. An iconic duo that have stood the test of time and proven that a winning formula will work regardless of the situation. Heyman does the talking, coins the catchphrases, and does whatever possible to make sure that he and Brock are happy and, importantly, always on top. Brock, for his part, punches people in the face. It really is a win-win.